and and what is your general impression when you when you uh, watch the movie we just saw? Well, I think that there's a number of important striking similarities. Um, yeah, I think I, I didn't have a pet with me, but there are at least seven striking similarities. The, the Michael Hudson story on the, the balance of payment problem. Um, the Netherlands is one of the uh, experts on balance of payment problems for tax havens, uh, and uh, the latest OECD handbook on foreign direct investment uh, was basically modeled uh, around a Dutch invention of how you can clean up your uh, your balance of payment, uh, because the Netherlands, of course, is a country with uh, special purpose entities uh, with, uh, well, over 4,000, uh, 4 trillion dollars flow through the Netherlands annually. So this creates big problems if you want to keep a, a nice balance of payment, if you want to, well, uh, have a, a nice control over your, your, your statistics. Uh, so since the 1980s, the central bank has been working on how to keep it clean, and now it has exported it to the rest of the world. Uh, of course, uh, we now also have the, uh, the penetration of McKinsey uh, providing a the latest uh, Minister of Finance, but uh, I don't think that was really necessary because if you go to speak to the Ministry of Finance, well, you very soon will recognize the same happens if you go to the, the Dutch Central Bank, that uh, well, they have completely internalized uh, not only the, the narrative, the story, but, but, but most importantly, I think that the need that they strategize on how to basically stay uh, ahead of the curve uh, ahead of the curve of well, this 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 call to re-regulate. I think that the Netherlands is is, uh, is very much aware of how it can uh, remain uh, better <coughs> for mostly the multinational corporations. Uh, well, I could go on and on. There's many similarities, but I think that um, perhaps more importantly is that uh, uh, the Netherlands it should not be uh, understood or looked upon by itself. It can only be understood in, in, in context. Uh, the offshore world is, is, a, is a global structure. Uh, of course, uh, the city of London uh, and the British Empire plays an important role in it. But of course, there's also a role for, uh, if we look empirically, if we look at what uh, CorpNet has been doing uh, in ownership structures or for direct investments, uh, portfolio investments, uh, well, we can recognize Luxembourg, Ireland, the Netherlands also have an important role so there are different geographies uh, at play, and I think it, this also reflects that the offshore world is a place where so many different motives and different types of elites meet. Uh, and uh, so it's not only about wealth elites, it's not only about illicit money flows, it's not only about uh, multinationals, uh, but I think essentially it's about the dynamic uh, of how <coughs> money is able to buy political power, uh, how it can transform money into well, sovereignty for sale, and how this leads to more money, <coughs> and how this is, uh, well, turning into a vicious cycle, and, well, City of London, of course, is an, <coughs> has a central role to play in it, but I would, I think it would be nice to have a series uh, to have the complement, <laughs> the complementary parts of the ocean world, uh, and so, because we need to see it as a whole, and of course, next to the wealth <coughs> needs, next to the multinationals, there is also this world that, well, of course, you touched upon in the about illicit flows. Um, and, and, and I think that it, the, um, the danger is that, well, as this is intermingled so much, as it has uh, become so far out of reach of democratic decision making, that uh, I think it will be harder and harder to really find effective ways to get out of this mess. Thank you very much um, uh, for this remark. So the spider web extends. Uh, maybe beyond the, the British territories or the former British Empire territories, maybe even uh, actually hearing you most likely also to uh, to Amsterdam. Just one, one other test to, to make sure what kind of crowd we have here. Who has an offshore account <laughs> <laughs> or knows somebody who has an offshore account? Try some. <laughs> Um, this is Elon Engelen, he's eager to speak, Elon, Elon, go, go he's the, the third member of our um, panel, uh, Elon Engelen, uh, Professor of uh, Financial Geography. 
Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sure. correct. Yeah. And uh, amongst authors, uh, amongst other uh, authors of the Schaduw Elite, yeah, uh, a, a vocal member of our uh, academic community, and uh, a concerned academic citizen. Um, with concerned, you mean um, politically engaged, I guess. So you're using some kind of a, a neutral metaphor to indicate that I'm politically engaged. A politically engaged <laughs> academic, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I, will, I would like to ask you, um, watching this movie, uh, observing this and the broader political economy uh, for a while, what, what are your observations and what, what do you think we should uh, worry about? Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, it was a disconcerting movie because it sort of indicated that there is this wealth protection industry working for the few and not for the many. Um, and of course, most of us, because that's why you came here, already sort of knew that. Uh, we've got a lot of leaks from insiders indicating that, hey, there is this infrastructure which works for the few and not for the many. Um, Lux leaks, Swiss leaks, um, uh, Paradise papers, Panama papers, uh, etc., etc. So most of us already knew a little bit about what was, what was actually going on. Um, and I'm not going to repeat what, what is in the movie because you, you just saw it yourself. But what I wanted to draw out is, is, is basically three points. The uh, first point is that um, we have this wonderful book by Piketty um, indicating that since the uh, 1970s, in the 20th century, we have seen a sort of return to what he called patrimonial capitalism. Basically, wealth and income inequalities at the same level as the late 19th century. Um, and that is uh, primarily caused by financialization, but also caused by the wealth protection industry that you could have seen at work for the, for the last 90 minutes. Um, and what is sort of quite striking, and uh, his um, PhD student, former PhD student, Kamil Zuckman, recently made that clear, um, that the wealth protection industry working through tax havens uh, uh, allowing tax evasion and tax avoidance um, have actually resulted in a, a very ex excessive understatement of the real income and wealth inequalities because a lot of it actually is outside of the data. So if you um, include the sort of um, estimates that come from the leaks that have been um, uh, presented to us over the last couple of years, we actually have to sort of accept that the level of income and wealth inequality in a lot of countries is actually much higher than the official statistics indicate. That's, that's one. The, the second thing that I wanted to draw out is um, the fact that this particular industry um, is eroding an um, implicit social contract. Uh, an implicit social contract which has come into existence in the uh, first half of the 20th century Hey guys, um, we let you fight our wars for us, um, and you're going to be hit by bullets from the enemy, so you're going to die in millions and hundreds of thousands, but in return we give you the welfare state. And the welfare state is then going to pay for by taxing both capital and, and, and labor. But what is actually happening since, again, the late 70s is that capital and capital owners have increasingly been able to opt out from their tax obligations. So despite the fact that in terms of share of um, public expenditure of GDP has actually increased, despite the neoliberal rhetoric, it has actually increased, most of that increase is actually being paid for not by capital, but by labor. Labor is the one that's actually paying for this. And the third element that I wanted to draw from this film, and that's something that Rodrigo already hinted at, is the fact that this results um, in basically a, it makes a charade of what we deem to be democracy. Democracy works through a very basic principle, one woman, one vote. But actually what we see is increasing penetration of politics by people working in the wealth protection industry, bankers, lawyers, accountants, and the, the guys and girls who manage trust firms. Um, and of course vice versa, civil servants who do the tax rulings in the Ministry of Finance uh, after their 55th birthday, when they say, well, hey, I want to cash in, they move to the, the, the big four accountancy firms. So it's revolving doors, it's cognitive regulatory capture, uh, which at the end of the day results not in a democracy, one woman, one vote, but in corporacy, 
basically meaning one euro, one uh, vote. Uh, and that is something that we see basically across the, across the, across the board. Uh, we see it in The Hague, where the first initiative which is launched by the new government is going to be the, uh, an educational repeal of the, the dividend taxation without any good argument, 1.4 billion euros on an annual basis, without any, any argument after five to six years of extensive austerity measures. Uh, and of course, it's clearly visible in places like Brussels, uh, London, Washington, which is one big lobbying campus, um, which again makes a charade of democracy. Now, what, what can we do about this? Um, we should vote differently, and we should pay more care to which particular firms we consume from. So, dump your apples, dump your Nikes, and dump all the rest of the shit, and start buying something else. We should boycott those bastards, and don't <laughs> shield yourself behind the sort of statement that comes from the elite, like, hey, it's only going to be managed if we come up with supranational regulation. If we should wait for supranational uh, um, regulation, then nothing is going to happen. We should do it unilaterally. We should close the Dutch tax haven tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything anymore. All, all of a sudden, the, the feeling of, of, of depression and sadness has now led to a sense of activism, activated. Uh, and I hope that in this period we can uh, continue the, the discussion for uh, another uh, uh, 30 to 40 minutes until um, and when we can continue the discussion uh, at, the, uh, at the bar, of course. Um, one, one remark as, as moderator here. There were a lot of a lot of men in the movie, right? Also in the, in the panel. And also in the panel. We have a, so maybe we can we can adjust that a little bit in the uh, in the discussion, or maybe not, we'll see. Uh, Q and A time for uh, uh, all of the uh, all the panelists. Um, so feel free to raise your hand and maybe we can um, collect a few questions. Please say who you are and uh, who you address the question to. We will collect a few. And in the interest of everybody here, please keep your questions short. <laughs> and I'm keeping the mic. I'm Dan Bokers, a PhD student here at the time, the only from the Lightning team. Um, I was wondering, uh, to John Christensen, I want to ask a question about this morning the report in the Financial Times about the European Commission's initiative was making a blacklist. Um, so I was wondering what your reflections are. Can I collect a few questions? Maybe some other questions for John right now, as he is on the see some questions here. Just raise your hand, yeah, in the back there. Uh, hi. So my question was And you are? Oh sorry. Uh, my name is Nick Hogan. Um, I was also once a student about this. Um, I just had a technical question with trusts. If the if, I want to make sure I understood this. If you transferred your ownership to this uh, other institution on this kind of agreement, they'll give it back to you one day in exchange for some kind of pay. Uh, and the intention is to avoid a governing authority uh, that would normally sort of make sure the contract carried out. Uh, then what's to stop the other party just walking away with your money and not giving it back to you? And if that is possible and it's all done with handshake agreements, what would stop, say, a young activist setting up a trust company and walking away with a lot of people's money. Hypothetically <laughs> 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 speaking. Uh, uh, one short question and then I'll continue somewhere if it was another question. Hi, my name is Joris. Uh, John as well. What I never understood is why countries like France and especially Germany powerful countries which are seemingly only losing out from this uh, tax avoidance structure, why are they not, you know, acting up more in the international uh, platform? So three probing questions. Um, John, would you have yeah. to respond? Okay, uh, the European Union blacklist is far too early to know which countries, which jurisdictions will be included. But so the blacklisting process has had a really bad history. The, um, 
it doesn't get mentioned much in the film, but the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which has been setting the rules for international cooperation in this area, or rather recommending rules, it has no policy-making powers, um, has, um, has issued several blacklists over the last uh, few decades. The first one was just little idols, strangely. Um, and yet, which are the really big tax haven players? Switzerland, United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Ireland, Luxembourg, all curiously OECD in countries, member states, uh, all of which contribute to the bu budget of the OECD, which lives in Paris. Um, and every time they've done something like this, um, most recently they've issued a a black, white, grey list, which and mysteriously most countries disappear from the black list almost immediately once they agree to cooperate on the most minimalist set of criteria. Um, and now there's only one country left there. Um, I don't even know which one it is somewhere. It might be... North Korea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pathetic. Um, and I can't be confident that the European Union won't do the same, because it's unlikely to include major European Union players, um, like Ireland and the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Um, so the whole thing becomes something of a charade. I mean, politically, we don't think it's good enough. We came up with an entirely different, much more scientifically based approach through our financial secrecy index, um, which gives a politically non-aligned view on this. And oddly enough, you'll find countries like the United States and Switzerland and so on right at the top. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not confident. Um, but the, what we heard today suggests there will be more jurisdictions on the list than we, we thought a week ago. Um, trusts. It ain't quite like that, my friend, otherwise you and I would go into business. Um, look, trusts have three parties in law. There can, can be other parties. You have the set law. That is the person who used to own the assets. Might be a pen. You and I could make a trust now. I make you trustee responsible for that pen. You don't own it. It belongs to a legal agreement we've just made. And I instruct you to pass it back to you for my exclusive use. That makes me the beneficiary. Three parties, set law, trustee, beneficiary. Now, what prevents you from running off with my pen is a huge body of law going back to the Middle Ages. Equity law, in the case of the UK, which, which means that if you do go off with those assets, which never belong to you, they belong to the agreement itself, and the agreement isn't registered, then you can be pursued through the courts. And the people, the settlers, are normally very wealthy and very powerful, they'll go to the end of the earth to get you into, into court and into jail. So there's a very strong body of law and jurisprudence to prevent you from setting up that business. Otherwise, we do it today. Um, and... The extraordinary thing is that the law, I mean, what worries me about trust is not just the transparency, but the fact that so many of the courts come down in favour of the trusts. There was a court ruling, ruling very recently where um, a Saudi, uh, the head of the or a major Saudi fund, investment fund, had actually defrauded a Spanish financial services company of 800 million, and that money had been parked in an offshore trust in Jersey. And when the Spanish courts found against the individual, against the Saudi, they then tried to pursue the money from the trust. But the Jersey courts ruled that the money didn't belong to that person, it belonged to the trust, and the trust hadn't done anything wrong. I mean, what? <laughs> um, so, very troubling <laughs> misuse of trusts. They can sit outside what you and I would regard as normal justice. Um, and it's long overdue that they were brought into the normal framework for justice. Now, the last question has completely escaped my mind now. What was it? Was Why do France and Germany? Ah, uh, yeah, France and Germany. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you can see now from the positioning, actually, France and Germany are both want quite a bit of business. <laughs> Post Brexit, a lot of citizens are going to be leaving the UK. And, and um, but and Germany is already, in many, many respects, a, an offshore secrecy jurisdiction. My colleague, Marcus Meinzer, has written a book about this. 
Germany ranks quite heavily within the top 10 on our secrecy jurisdiction. How many people would be surprised by that? I mean, put your hands up if you knew that already. <laughs> so, you know, not many people think that Germany has actually been quietly tailoring its laws around developing Frankfurt as an offshore financial sector with quite a high degree of secrecy as well. Um, France was in on the game very early on. Um, I mean, historically, the French colonials, as they withdraw, withdrew from Indochina and from North Africa, Tangiers in Morocco, when it was French colonial, Morocco was one of the big sinks of offshore activity. That was brought on shore actually into Geneva. And I think that France is now positioning. But you know, for years and years, France and Germany and Italy and others were trying to do to move forward, whilst Britain was at the table in Brussels, they could make no progress. Britain's now withdrawing from the table. And when I was in the Channel Islands recently, they were very depressed indeed, because their, their protector was no longer there to protect them. <laughs> so an interesting new political dynamics building up here. May I add, add something to the, the, the France-Germany kind of, kind of story? Um, it, it, it's obvious if you look at the uh, tax income um, that especially the larger economies in the European Union are the ones that are losing out most from multinational tax avoidance schemes. Um, but you have to keep into consideration that um, it is multinationals like Volkswagen, Deutsche Bank, uh, Siemens and all the other big German players who by avoiding paying taxes in Germany um, are able to maximize their profitability um, which of course generates them employment in, in partly, partially at least in Germany. So it's, it's a complicated deal from the perspective of the Dutch, of, of the German treasurer. And they lose out something in terms of tax income, but they get it back uh, through income taxation by extra employment which is generated due to the excessive profitability of some of the multinationals. And that, that sort of complicates the overall sort of tax game in, in the European Union. And of course, it's, it's completely co correct that um, it has always had any, any attempt on the European level to come up with harmonization of corporate taxation has always been blocked by players like Luxembourg, Ireland, the Netherlands, and, and the UK, and, and Belgium also. Yeah. Further questions for the panelists. Uh, one over there. Yeah, but no, I'm, 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 I'm completely at fault in this, in this regard. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, another question here in this area, maybe. Now, uh, while I'm here. One more question in the back. Hi, my name is Soren Ganadai, and uh, my question is towards the last gentleman, who said that the deal with Volkswagen and Deutsche Bank is complicated because they provide uh, employment to the German economy but advised us earlier to ditch our Apples and our Nikes because they avoid tax. But essentially, can't we make the same argument for those American companies that are essentially becoming more profitable by avoiding tax and giving employment to not necessarily only American economies, but wherever else they operate? So that's one. The second question is, uh, towards Mr. John Christensen, I would like to know a little bit more about the movie, the second movie that you talked about, and uh, the financial, financial curse that you talked about. 
So the UK and it's uh, sorry, I know I'm yeah. taking. Watch the question. Yes. So with the Brexit and uh, with with Brexit and themselves shooting uh, shooting themselves on the foot, you say it's only because of finance. But isn't immigration playing a big role in that as well? Because there are other financial centres like. Switzerland that are very homogeneous and we don't see that same financial curse. So can you comment on that and perhaps explain what financial curse means? <coughs> so what is it that you don't see in Switzerland that you do see in Switzerland? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the panelists <coughs> to uh, uh, answer, but then you get the microphone. <laughs> okay, well, shall I be, begin by uh, responding to that one. I, I would also like to talk a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the obvious gap in economics, uh, which has hampered my, my career in, in this area since the 1970s. Um, look, the finance curse, not financial curse, but the finance curse, is a, quite a sophisticated political economic phenomenon. The international political economists amongst you will, will probably know of the resource curse, which afflicts uh, oil and gas exporting countries primarily. Um, uh, and we see very similar things happening in countries with a, a really, really large offshore, an, an overbearing, oversized financial sector. Uh, you, first of all, you have the so-called Dutch disease impact on your exchange rates and on nominal infl on inflation rates. Okay. Um, secondly, you have a very large brain drain of people, very often highly educated and skilled engineers coming out of postgrad courses, going straight to the City of London, working in, in, in hedge funds. Um, thirdly, you have um, over-dependence upon an industry which um, is generating such a large portion of your overseas, of overseas earnings. Um, you have state capture arising from that, and regulatory capture as well. In other words, quite a number of the, the um, phenomena that we identify with the resource curse seem to oddly coincide with countries with an oversized financial services sector. And we see, certainly see that in, in Britain. Um, I saw that in Jersey as economic advisor of the government. The top line of my job description was to maintain a balanced and diversified economy. And the only honest advice I could give to the politicians was stop licensing banks to come here because you're killing off any attempt at diversifying the economy. The more banks you license here, the more you'll kill off tourism and light manufacturing activity and so on, for all the same reasons that you see that happen in oil exporting provinces. Um, so it's, it's quite a sophisticated um, uh, political <coughs> phenomenon. There's a, a growing literature. Nick Jackson and I published a monograph about it, looking at the empirical data for the United Kingdom in 2013. And we're now setting up a research committee, um, largely around Sperry, the she Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute, but we are involving academics from around Europe and around the world, we hope eventually, in this. Because I think as a, as a narrative to explain the financialization of uh, economies like the United Kingdom and others, um, I think it provides a, a good narrative which the general public might understand better than that word financialization. Mm -hmm. How can finance be bad for an economy? Well, actually, start looking at how it's played out in the United Kingdom and look at what a divided country it is. Um, now, sorry, you're, you asked me a specific question that's completely escaped me. Pension funds. Pension funds. Where do they fit into the bigger picture? <coughs> yeah, that's an interesting question because they, you know, I, I, I talk, I've talked a lot with pension funds um, about why they use places like Guernsey and Bermuda and Luxembourg, um, and um, none of what they say makes any sense to me, because I think exactly the same thing could happen in Antwerp, or Harrogate, or Oxford, or Cheshire, where I live. Um, so why are they doing it? Uh, I think they're doing it partly because it's very profitable for the, the fund managers themselves, and they like to sit offshore in a, a detached uh, things because personally they pay much less tax as a result of it. That's, that's one plausible reason. But they also argue, and it's completely false, that there they can mingle their funds into large pools of funds which can enjoy 
the double taxation agreements. But frankly, there's a double taxation agreement between London or Britain, which applies as much to Hartlepool as it does to anywhere else. Um, so that is not a plausible or credible reason. I think it's largely because the funds themselves, uh, or people in London, uh, are making a lot of money, and, and they like to do it, I'm not sure. It's also very possible that they're not regulated really strongly. Can I? Uh yeah, I think, that's, I think that we need to recognize that there was a structural transformation uh, the way in which global financial markets are organized. And uh, there are some countries with pension funds that are old, like the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, that were formed in the, the 1920s. Um, this was also, the 1920s was also a period uh, in which uh, uh, well, basically, this was the period in which the, the bilateral tax treaties were formed. Um, this was a period at the end of, of a cycle of globalization. Uh, London was still, or was in a transition of declining, uh, but, the, the, but London uh, and the US, they were instrumental in the way in which these bilateral treaties were shaped and how the right to tax, uh, well, were organized, and, and, and this mess that was created in the 1920s is what we inherited today. But for a long time, this whole underlying structure of bilateral tax treaties, uh, tax laws, uh, possibilities to avoid taxation, um, well, was not that influential in the way in which uh, financial markets were organized or operated uh, for the, in the 1940s, in the 1950s, 60s. But it was, it was really in the period of, uh, again, when the process of globalization resurfaced and cross-border capital flows became more important, that uh, these older well, legal possibilities, loopholes, ideas, principles, categories uh, resurfaced and were re reused and um, basically became very much dominating uh, the way in which financial assets are organized, are traded, and as a pension fund nowadays, uh, it is, I think, very difficult, if not impossible, not to be engaging with some sort of a financial intermediary that organizes stuff offshore. Uh, ten, 20 years ago, for a multinational, it was perhaps exotic to organize your stuff offshore. Now, you are very exotic if you don't do it. So, there was an offshore term uh, which, which flipped much of what previously was seen as exotic, now it is mainstream. Uh, and, and so this is, I think, the context in which... <laughs> I'm sorry, somebody just like this shoe again. It's Nike. It's Nike. That's amazing. <laughs> Send it to Jersey. That's <laughs> Uh, there, 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 was, there, was, there were a couple of questions. There was a question up there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, 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 my first response is that this is this is not my storyline. That's the official storyline. That it actually generates employment, uh, and that is the way in which the, the German government is being blackmailed to basically accept the the current state of, 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 of affairs. The same is of course true with Apple in relationship to the U.S. government. Uh, they're basically stating, "Well, hey, we generate employment, so." Please make sure that we do not need to pay taxes on our um, extraterritorial, so <coughs> the non-US profits that we make, and allow us to keep it in Ireland and places like that. I, I, I don't buy the storyline because most of those multinationals do not actually generate any employment in their the, the places where they are established. They generate employment um, in, 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 in cheap labor countries, basically, that's what they're doing. So that's, that's, that's the first one. The, the, the second one was about academia. Um, there, there are two parts to that particular question. And first of all, and this is basically how finance works. Finance works through unnecessary complexity. And the unnecessary complexity is simply a means to ensure that it all remains intransparent to the average citizen. Well, most academics are an expert in a particular discipline or in a particular field. But in all the other fields, or related to all the other topics, they are just like average citizens. So it's only a small bunch of academics who do possess the empirical expertise to understand what is going on in international tax arbitrage. And most of the academics who are actually experts in international tax arbitrage have a huge incentive to 
keep shut about what is going on because they can earn approximately 1.3 million euros on an annual basis by becoming a tax partner, a tax specialist partner of PricewaterhouseCooper, KPMG, etc., etc. So the story, the, the situation actually is that we Dutch citizens, we pay universities to actually train tax specialists who are then going to rob other treasuries of tax income. That's what is going on. And the amazing thing is that we actually allow them to do that. So a lot of tax specialist professors working at the University of Amsterdam, for instance, they have a one day a week professorship and four days a week they are tax partner of PricewaterhouseCooper. And whenever there is some international hubbub of over the role of the Netherlands in international tax arbitrage, what then happens is that they write an op-ed piece to a Dutch newspaper indicating that all is nice and well, and it's all legal what is going on in the Netherlands, and they sign off that op-ed piece not, not as a partner of PricewaterhouseCooper, but as a professor of taxation of the University of Amsterdam to gain credibility. So basically, they use their academic status to deflect any attack on the Dutch tax haven. This has been going on for, for years now. So academia is hugely involved in the reproduction over time of the particular type of professional expertise that is involved in the Dutch tax haven. It's corruption, ladies and gentlemen. Not legal corruption, but absolutely moral corruption. And it's happening on a huge scale. Um. I was just wondering, is it, is, it, is it maybe helpful not to talk about offshore anymore? Because it's onshore. Yeah, I mean, offshore is always onshore somewhere else. It's the idea that yeah. it's somewhere else, it's not here. They play on this idea. But what, what's, if, if that's a good idea, then what's an alternative? No, stay with offshore. Let's abandon the idea that offshore is a place for palm trees and so on. Any transaction which actually, ha where the events, the economic substance happens, let's say here in Amsterdam, but it's put for accounting purposes in Luxembourg is offshore. It doesn't have to be a coastline between the two. The point is that is a, it has been transacted in El a different country elsewhere, as Alex said in the film. That's the important thing to remember about, about uh, offshore. I want to come in back, back to this point about the Amazons and Googles and so on and all the employment that they create. That's total shit. They're sitting on, <laughs> sitting on piles of cash reserves which they are clueless about what to do with. They have no idea what to do with all the money they've accumulated as a result of having global monopolies. In the case of Apple, I have a particular... I mean, anyone who, Got a, uh, an Apple Pro, just pile them down here, please. <laughs> uh, trample on them later. And Apple, of course, is free, free rided by and large all of its technologies. Any of you who's read, uh, read Mariana Matakatu's books will know that most of the technologies were worked up in the 60s and the 70s on the back of massive taxpayer investment into MIT in the United States. Almost all the sexy stuff you love, including the, the screens and so on, touch screen. That, was public investment that Apple simply turned into a nice, nicely packaged product. Um, they have no idea what to do with their money. They're not creating jobs anywhere. They have no idea what to do with the, for the next generation. They're bringing out Apple 9. Perhaps they'll have a, a razor or something for people like me, but I don't know. Um, you know, there hasn't actually been that much advance as a thing, thanks to Apple. Uh, Google, just a gigantic global monopoly. Amazon, ditto, blah, blah, blah. In other words, they're not actually functioning that well within a global political within a global economy. They're not doing the job of creating jobs, recycling that money. The only way we can recycle that money back into the economy is through tax, and they go to great lengths to avoid doing that. Well, they're, they're actually they're recycling it, but in a very peculiar way. Ah, yes. I mean, uh, if you look at Apple, it has financial reserves of over 200 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, basically, what it does it it avoids paying taxes, but instead it buys bonds. Yeah. So it, it makes profit from its own, from its own tax avoidance. Yeah. And uh, I think that... Well, I think that's just to rephrase that for a second. Rather than repatriate their, um, their profits 
yeah. to the United States. They borrow to pay dividends. They, they, no, they lend that money to the United States, because the, money, the United States can't get the tax revenue, so they have to borrow more. Mm -hmm. I think that the craziness of this through, and you, know, you, you begin to recognize that this is actually a madness. Uh, uh, I, I do have a few more questions in the audience, and uh, we are slowly but certainly running out of time, and you can see what's happening with the hands are going up, which is a good thing. So I'll just collect uh, the person with the, with the red job. Your, your business is still... The <coughs> over there, the Brexit was also about migration and xenophobia, and that the same thing was not happening in Brooklyn, while the same thing is happening in Brooklyn. That was my excitement of saying xenophobia yeah. is very much also the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some questions here. Uh, I'm following this question about what are the democratic decisions of Brexit could affect on this interpretation of Brexit or that? And do you direct the question to somebody in particular, or to the panel in general? Um, I'm Simon. I wanted to ask a question to the guy in the middle whose name I forgot. I'm sorry. Rodrigo. Rodrigo, I'm sorry. Uh, in advance. And what I would like to ask, ask is, in the in the movie, it shortly talked about the finance curse and about the effects it had on real estate investment. Uh, in Amsterdam, we're also seeing uh, rising house prices right now. Uh, could you, do you think that that is actually an effect of the finance curves hitting Amsterdam, and if so, like rank it a little bit with Airbnb um, and other effects that had, which supposedly have an effect on house prices in the There are a few questions here in the middle of the audience. Let's see if it works without uh, a microphone. Uh, so, uh, please, good question. Uh, Philippe Bousset, lecture at the Bullet Science Department. Uh, you, you ended up your movie with five steps, and I was just uh, wanted to ask you if there's any political roadmap how to implement any of those steps. Uh, let's say two more questions, please. Uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, I was wondering the uh, uh, the use of uh, state aid in the, in the, the European Commission to, to claw back some of those um, hidden uh, tax wealth. Is it random? How should we see it? Is it an instrument that works or discriminates? Um, just your thoughts on that. Yeah. So now a last question. Just going over there. Uh, my question is related to the, to the professor's question here about the five steps there. Considering the fact that uh, left-wing reforms have been rolled back in most countries in the last 30 years, um, are reforms not self-defeating uh, as a solution to this problem? And is it not maybe time to reconsider the fact that maybe capitalism itself is a problem? <laughs> the probing question, I think all of the panelists uh, uh, have some reflections uh, uh, on that. Um, Shall we do this in the right order? So, are you, you could give the <coughs> final, final say. Uh, in any case, uh, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, don't you first? Okay. I, I knew the Brexit would come up, uh, uh, <laughs> and I have made a separate bill about that. Look, Brexit, um, I think so, Britain is so different from Switzerland, because Britain is a very much more unequal society. Um, um, and let's be blunt, uh, the immigration issue was played up by the populists, by Nigel Farage and his team. And just bear in mind and reflect on this for a second, he is from the city of London. What was their interest post-financial crisis in stirring up a shitstorm around immigration? Okay, leave that one with you. My own view is the whole thing uh, was designed to deflect. No one expected Brexit, the, the result that came through, was designed to deflect public attention away from the, you know, the deep unpopularity of the banking sector in Britain, which was being called into question. Anyway, people were asking, is the city of London worth having? And I was giving a very clear answer, no. Um, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have five minutes, uh, John, so. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, capitalism itself is it, it's clearly facing a profound crisis, it's not delivering in its current form. The particular brand of capitalism that I've been looking at, which can trades under the term the Washington Consensus is a busted flush. The IMF have <coughs> accepted that. We're seeing very interesting uh, um, you know, 
shifts happening. Um, uh, it's a, a moot point whether capitalism can actually dig itself out. At the moment, it's frankly too much of a threat to society, to democracy, and to uh, uh, global ecological survival. Um, so hard to say. Look, as a campaigner, uh, those five demands, well, you know, ours is a very thoroughgoing critique, I think, of a particular type of neoliberalism, of financial marketing regulation, detaxing, and so on. Um, but when you're campaigning, you actually have to put some, you know, people say, what can you do? Well, here are five things, not only that we could do, most of those measures are in place. Country by country reporting by multinational companies is a, now, a global standard. Automatic information exchange has now been implemented through the common reporting standard. Requiring public registry of beneficial ownership is a work in progress, but we have had recognition from G20, they're pushing for it. What they don't want to do is make it public, and that's not nearly good enough. So we've seen quite a bit of progress as a result of public you know, civil society campaigning. Um, and, and, my, and my job as a campaigner is always to add more things to, to you know, the logs to the fire to keep it going forward. But um, I think the, the key task that we face is to make the public aware of this, because the assumption has been all along that as, as capitalism has evolved into a dominant financial capitalism, that you can't have enough money. But I think that's now being very comprehensively challenged, the idea of fiat banking, you know, the banks being able to issue as much money as they wish to create one bubble after another, uh, is now recognized as, a, as a, you know, a global hazard. We're now in the same position we were 10 years ago, and it's more hazardous because we have less reserves to call on. And our societies are failing, certainly in Britain. They're failing, you can see the same in the United States. I think Netherlands has components of that. Your democracy is under pressure. Go further east into the, you know, Hungary and so on, the situation gets even worse. So, can, can, can I ask, uh, end of. To, to, to reflect on this as well, because I know uh, you have some, some uh, well developed thoughts on this as well. Well, I mean, I think we, it's obviously capitalism, uh, but we had been here before. Uh, it, it, it was always capitalism. Uh, um, I don't think it was ever something else. Uh, I don't think that there are some easy solutions. I think that what we can clearly see is that there's this dynamic of a growing <coughs> capital share, um, making it ever more powerful, giving it ever more offshore space. Uh, now we have this brand of Pluto populism, uh, which may turn uh, more authoritarian uh, while we're talking. Uh, uh, so th this is not a, 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 a pretty sight, but I think that uh, we've been here before, and uh, and so perhaps uh, it's the, the perhaps we could uh, see it as a, a, we could recognize some sort of a Trotsky strategy in this, and and, and think of transition demands, uh, so uh, idea demands that sound reasonable within the current context, but if you think through them, they uh, they mean a, a fundamental shift and change. And I think that uh, in these transition demands uh, towards the offshore world, uh, it should at least include uh, well one of the fundamental issues. And this is this uh, this idea that you can be somewhere legally without being there. This is so ridiculous uh, and such a, a, a man-made uh, well charade. Th this is this goes to the core uh, because if, if you can if you really need to be physically present in a in a jurisdiction to claim the rights, uh, this, this 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 would really uh, harm the mobility of capital as we know it. Uh, and of course, although it is a, it's a, rig a ridiculous aspect of the financialized capitalism as we know it today, this already would be very, very difficult. But I think that the focus should be on full substance. You cannot, you, you cannot claim to be somewhere you are not. And, and, and I, so this would be one of those uh, transition demands I would uh, put on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, um, the, the politics of it all. Uh, if you sort of accept that uh, international tax arbitrage works through secrecy, complexity, and intransparency, um, it's obvious that what we need 10 years after the crisis, which was, of course, a clear example of capitalism not working for the many, but only working for the few, uh, an elite which was supposed to manage that particular form of capitalism, 
which made an absolute mess of it, um, which at the end of the day means that there is a, um, there's a lot of unexpressed, unarticulated, unarticulated electoral anger over um, global finance. So what, if you add the two, uh, the need to remain in secrecy, complexity and transparency, and at the same time a lot of unarticulated anger on the side of the electorate, then, then the kind of stuff that we need in order to turn this into a political issue instead of an expert issue which is debated in the back offices of the OECD in the context of base erosion and profit shifting initiatives, what we need is more leaks. We need the next leak should be Dutch leaks. We need a converted uh, accountant or a fiscal special tax specialist from PricewaterhouseCooper who basically hands over to a bunch of journalists a batch of documents which clearly stipulates the huge <coughs> extent to which Dutch states, the big four, are involved in order to ensure that Dutch taxpayers pay the, pay the bill for the maintenance and repair of our material and immaterial infrastructure while capital doesn't pay a shit. And that's what we need. This reminds me, and, and somebody, I think it was somebody from News Group called me after the, uh, uh, the Paradise Papers, and he, he said, well, now again there is a leak. When, when will this stop? How long do you think this will continue? I mean, how many leaks can there be? Oh, <laughs> and that's a journalist. The journalist, the journalist. <laughs> unbelievable. And I said, well, hopefully it will go on for a while. For it a used while. to be the fourth estate, wasn't it? Um, it's, it's time time for us to leave this room, but not to end this conversation. Um, I would like to thank the panelists and most of all uh, John for being here, but most of all for making this movie. Thank you very much. Know that you have a lot of friends here in, in Amsterdam. Um, so you're going to Brussels next. Maybe you can say a bit about uh, what you're going to do next week, next month, and next year. <laughs> First of all, um, on behalf of the Tax Justice Network, a bit of a plea. Um, there might be some of you who uh, might, might want to change the world. God knows it needs it. Uh, and it's changing the world, does, our, our mission is to keep a conversation going about what can be done. I think the film can contribute to that. So if you, if you use any kind of social media, um, encourage your friends, family, foes, the whole lot to watch the film. I think it will challenge a lot of people's ideas about the way the world works. Uh, that was the intention. We have a certain idea about the way the world works. Um, but when you look underneath the, you know, get, get in underneath the, uh, the covers, a very different world works out there. Uh, a, a world in which multinational companies and their uh, owners will shape the rules very much to their, their benefits. Um, the way I see it, the rules set by the OECD were deliberately, knowingly, purposefully shaped in the way they are to enable capital from the north that is from Europe and North America, and up to a point in Japan, to penetrate markets in the South in ways which would lower their tax burden, allow them to free ride the public services and all the natural resources they were able to exploit. None of this happened by accident. It happened by design. We rigged a post-formal imperial world in which, having set the rules to our advantage, we were able to exploit the situation and continue to do that. And the only way we can change that is by confronting that power head on. It's, it's not that different, in my opinion, to overthrowing the slave economies of North America. So it's a big battle we have on, on our hands. Uh, on to Brussels, where we're talking about Finance Watch. And of course, as you all know, there's another colossal debt overhand, huge financial risks in the market. Uh, so Finance Watch now needs to start preparing for the next financial crisis. Um, and uh, then back to London to make the next film. I really hope that we might be able to premiere the next film in Amsterdam once it's ready for 2019. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, you're very welcome at the next.